In this 14th lecture in our series, I want to discuss anarchism and the example of Emma Goldman. First, let's look at a history of anarchism, definition of the term, because I think that there is often confusion or misunderstanding about its origins and what it means. The word anarchism is derived from the Greek, anarchia, and uh, I think we should at the outset pause for a moment not just to understand the precise meaning of the word, but equally important, the feeling it had uh, for many Greek citizens of the polis, and particularly for advocates of the polis like Plato and Aristotle, who said above all that we are political animals and that we will experience our fulfillment only within the polis or within the state. The word then has two components. First, archi, which means in a literal sense a village leader or a village head. But Plato uses the term in a broader philosophical sense to mean a, an organizing principle, an overarching concept that gives meaning to a philosophy or to an understanding of life and the world. So archi is a key term in Greek thought as well as in Greek politics. It means a sense of order. Now, anarchy means without order, without a village head or without a village leader. On the one hand, or in a broader sense, in the Platonic sense, without an organizing principle. And it suggests a sense of chaos. Uh, certainly, that was the feeling that many Greek citizens had about the concept of anarchism, uh, that it was a principle that stood for no principles. That is, it stood for no order, only for a chaotic, meaningless universe. It is perhaps true, then, that you'll recall Creon's comment in the Antigone that we analyzed much earlier on, even though Creon is a, an unfavorable character in that play, and the portrayal of him is not flattering from any point of view, nevertheless, he talks about anarchy in that play in a way that is representative of how the Greek citizen would have seen the idea and the practice of anarchy. He says, you'll recall at one point when he's evoking his own authority, if a person sets himself up above the law and tries to tell his rulers what they ought to do, you can't expect me to approve of that. And then he concludes, there is nothing so disastrous as anarchy. And he then conjures up this idea of what anarchy means. It means plundered cities, homeless people, a lack of discipline. That, from the Greek point of view, all suggested what Thucydides condemned, remember in the chapter on the revolution in Corsairo, uh, when he said, people went to every extreme and beyond it. The anarchists were, from this point of view, guilty of going to every extreme and beyond it. And yet, although many Greeks, particularly during the chaos and disruptions of the Peloponnesian War that Thucydides described, as you'll recall, though many Greeks, Greeks feared, hated the idea of anarchism, there were advocates of anarchism in Greece during this period. And we say that almost everything traces back in our Western intellectual tradition to that incredibly fertile period in Athens during the 5th, 4th century BC. And during that period, the idea of anarchism emerged as much as it was held in disrepute by the great philosophers. The idea of Anarchia, uh, then, as it was set forth first by Zeno, who was in Greece a 3rd century B.C. philosopher and who studied at Plato's academy after Plato had died, and who subsequently founded the school of Stoicism. Uh, Zeno was, so far as we can tell, the first Greek who set forth in the 3rd century B.C. in Greek philosophy a systematic treatise on anarchism. Zeno advocated then a stateless society, which was just anathema to both Plato and Aristotle, a stateless society in which perfect equality and individual freedom 
would enable people to recover their natural goodness and to establish, and here's where the Stoicism eventually came in, a cosmopolitan society in which there would be perfect harmony. A century after Zeno, another Greek, Carpocrates, joined him in urging the abolition of the state, and he went beyond Zeno in advocating the elimination of private property as well, which became, became an important theme in the 19th century with anarchists like Pierre Proudhon. This, from Carpocrates' point of view, abolition of private property would pave the way for an abolition of selfish, narrow possessiveness. And he again conjured up images of extreme individualism, the joys of complete sexual freedom, things that the Greeks did not take to immediately because they were, remember, concerned about going to every extreme and beyond it. And uh, they wanted, I think Aristotle suggested rightly that the tenor and tone of what the Greeks wanted when he said nothing to excess, all in moderation. The anarchists suggested too much, as we said, going to excess, immoderation. But anarchism had only a brief moment of glory in the ancient world. When we talk about anarchism, most of our attention has to be given to its development in the 19th and 20th centuries, when anarchism, as we'll see in the context of the example of Emma Goldman, came into its own. Anarchism, I think, cannot be rightly called simply an ideological reflex of the industrial age, but there can be no question that the immense material changes of the Industrial Revolution did interact with the anarchist tradition and did give an unprecedented impetus to the development of anarchist doctrine because the anarchists at the end of the 18th century become so concerned with the way in which technology dehumanizes us and alienates us and, of course, their main theme is we must achieve a sense of harmony and community in response to the dehumanizing impact of the Industrial Revolution that Thoreau, that, uh, Thoreau and, uh, earlier, Rousseau so deplored. So the anarchists are not only like Thoreau, as we commented before, uh, but also, before that, they definitely sympathize with much of what Rousseau had to say. We begin, then, in terms of the modern definition and meaning of anarchism in as late as 1793 with William Godwin's treatise, An Inquiry Concerning Political Justice. Students of anarchism more or less have a consensus, have formed a consensus that the modern concept of anarchism does begin with William Godwin. And Godwin was an extreme optimist to argue that the phalanx of reason, as he says in this brilliant work, will march on and given the inexorable progress of our time, will lead us to a time when anarchism will become uh, the only form of order in society. And he argued that anarchism does preach an order in society, and that's a sense of equality, harmony, that is based upon a sense of reason. So he looked for the rational development of individuals. And as George Woodcock says in his excellent book on anarchism, I would suggest that this book, more than any other in terms of anarchist theory, a study of anarchist theory is by George Woodcock, spelled just as it sounds, and uh, his book called Anarchism treats William Godwin extremely well. He's also written a separate book just on Godwin. The main theme being that anarchists beginning in 1793 with Godwin's inquiry concerning political justice state in this optimistic manner that eventually humans will evolve due to their rationality in a way that they will not need government. George Woodcock defines anarchism at the beginning of his book in a way that I think most anarchists would accept, uh, he defines it as a system of thought aiming at fundamental changes in the structure of society and particularly at the replacement of the authoritarian state by some form of non-governmental cooperation between free individuals. I think this is a good definition. It packs an awful lot into it. The key words in the definition are fundamental changes Anarchists were surely revolutionaries to the core. 
replacement of the authoritarian state, as we'll see when we talk about the principles of anarchism, one of the key principles is the way in which the anarchists oppose all state authority. They see the state as, by definition, authoritarian then. And then Woodcock's mention of cooperation, free individuals, points to the principle that we'll be discussing, and that is the way in which anarchists try to resolve the tension between freedom and equality. And these words, then, this definition, reflects the central concerns of all anarchists. That is, the problem of creating a change that's really fundamental a complete transformation of the existing society. The problem of getting rid of the state in the process of this evolution and uh, therefore of repressive, alien, unnatural authority and the problem of realizing a cooperative spirit among people by allowing them to overcome the oppressiveness of the state and other authoritarian organizations. The anarchists want then in all of this to achieve freedom with equality, as we'll see. Now we turn to the example, the specific example, of Emma Goldman, who uh, was an anarchist extraordinaire. She was born in 1869, the same year as we'll see that Gandhi was born, and she died in 1940. She was born in Russia and she emigrated from there to the United States in 1886. She relates in her autobiography, which I know some of you have read and have discussed with you, the autobiography called Living My Life, a remarkable autobiography by any account of any political or social leader. In Living My Life, she tells how her authoritarian father instilled in her a desire to rebel. In that autobiography, she says, and this is just one of many passages that could be cited about her childhood and the way in which she was abused, my ghastly childhood always stands before me, my hunger for affection, which mother was unable to satisfy, and father's harshness towards the children, his violent outbreaks, his beating my sisters and me. Two frightful experiences are particularly fresh in my mind. Once father lashed me with a strap so that my little brother Herman, awakened by my cries, came running up and bit father on the calf, and the lashing stopped. My older sister Helena, Helena is one of the heroines of the autobiography because she keeps rescuing Emma from these attacks from her father. My sister Helena took me to her room, bathed my bruised back, brought me milk, held me to her heart, tears mingling with mine, while father outside was raging, I'll kill her, I'll kill that brat, I'll teach her to obey. Well, those words in themselves would indicate the way in which Emma Goldman developed a very strong anti-authoritarian spirit. And she concludes this passage by saying, in the moving terms that recur throughout this brilliant book, my father was handsome, he was dashing, he was full of vitality. I loved him even while I was afraid of him. I wanted him to love me, but I never knew how to reach his heart. His hardness served only to make me more contrary. Well, that's a typical anarchist expression. I never knew how to reach his heart. And remember Rousseau's comment, if only in the context of the Kitty Genovese story, is not really Rousseau's comment, but it's a comment I think that's suggestive of Rousseau, and that is when we said, one of the 38 witnesses, if only I had listened to my heart. This is a, a sentiment that the anarchists keep emphasizing, and that is, if only we will listen to our hearts, and our hearts speak to us not with the aggressiveness that Freud suggests, that are in is, that is in our hearts, all of our hearts, that sinister evil impulse, uh, but rather uh, our hearts for the anarchists, as for Rousseau, suggest something, as we'll see, benign, compassionate, gentle, and she did not know how to reach his heart. In a moving passage, she says uh, that she realizes, as a result of her childhood, how many children there are who are unloved in this world, and how she decided she will never have children herself, because she could not bear to bring kids into this world. And it's said that she resolved, instead of having children herself, to become a midwife, she, as she says. 
so that at least, at least she could be involved in bringing new life into the world. And she remarked, I want to deliver a thousand babies. And as each one arrives, especially the little girls, I'll be there first to whisper into her tender little ear, rebel, rebel. It's that kind of sentiment that's so much at the heart of the anarchists, that is the way in which they will evoke uh, this tender spirit, but then there's always this edge to it, rebel. We must overthrow uh, the corrupt authority that's all around us, and Emma Goldman was the first woman that we're considering in this series. Emma Goldman speaks specifically for her gender over and again. Her spirit of rebellion became political in 1887 at age 18, when she was enraged at the injustice dealt to anarchists in Chicago, and uh, then she was inspired by the ideal of anarchism, a story which was, is vividly told in her autobiography when she attends a public speech by an anarchist, and she's just transformed by the magnetism of that woman, Joanna Gray, who turns her towards this doctrine. Her political career begins in New York City. She lived, of course, in Greenwich Village, at 210 East 13th Street, and she joined there a community of anarchists like Johann Most and Alexander Berkman, and they promoted causes in the early 20th century, such as better work conditions for women seamstresses. She quickly became, more than any other anarchist of our time, one of the most inspiring orators that America has ever seen. There are stories, legends of her oratory as she would stand in Washington Square and preach the doctrine of anarchism, which they are perhaps beyond belief, the way in which she will convert people who are convinced of the opposite point of view and they will come and embrace her and ask, how can I join this movement? Uh, so a, a real gift here, a gift that she had sensed early on, I think, when she was turned onto the doctrine by Joanna Gree. She was imprisoned again and again for these speeches. She was just too dangerous. She was imprisoned in uh, 1893 for a speech that attempted to incite the unemployed of New York City to riot for better work conditions. And she persisted in preaching unpopular causes. Again and again, she said, I feel my element only in opposition. And she certainly was continually in opposition. She would preach everywhere free love and atheism to Christian audiences. She would f preach conscientious objection to World War I, uh, to any soldiers, military that she could find. Uh, she would preach birth control. Imagine during this time in the early 1900s preaching birth control. The advocacy of birth control was illegal, and she was arrested for her addresses on birth control. On this last issue of birth control, she was especially adamant, and uh, she went to prison for, as I said, preaching it. In an excellent biography of Emma Goldman by Candace Falk, uh, Falk explains Emma's position on birth control. She says, in 1916, Emma Goldman continued to wage the battle for birth control in her own way assuring readers of her journal, Mother Earth. Emma Goldman edited a journal called Mother Earth. She said in that journal, I may be arrested, I may be tried and thrown into jail, but I will never be silent. I never will acquiesce or submit to authority, nor will I make peace with a system which degrades women to a mere incubator. I now and here declare war upon this system and shall not rest until the path has been cleared for a free motherhood and a healthy, joyous, and happy childhood. We've seen people like Marx represent the feminist cause in the 19th century. Now we see Emma Goldman with a new intimacy represent the cause of women. And uh, when she speaks to women being degraded as a result of being turned into incubators, I think that she speaks in a way that Karl Marx, John Stuart Mill, advocates of the women's cause in the 19th century, uh, did not convey. There is more power in Emma Goldman's comments. Given the choice that she was between a fine of $100, Falk tells us, for preaching birth control, or 15 days in the Queens County Jail, Emma consistently opted for prison. Uh, that is, for advocating in her works that 
in her words, women need not always keep their mouths shut and their wombs open. She went to jail then with that cry. She actually preferred prison, she insisted, as she wrote to a friend, because her jail term gave her a convenient opportunity to diet. Now, when we talk about Emma Goldman's philosophy in the context of anarchism, then, I want to discuss it then in the context of five principles of anarchism, principles that I think are suggested by George Woodcock's definition of anarchism, uh, and uh, principles that suggest, I think, a consensus among anarchists. And these principles are always related, of course, directly or indirectly, to their response to power. Now, the first of these principles is con uh, concerns human nature, their view of human nature. A philosopher's view of human nature is always at the basis of what she or he thinks about society. In the anarchist case, uh, they believe that human nature is fundamentally benign, but it's also dynamic. It has abundant capacities for a wide range of behavior, whether malevolent and benign, or cowardly and heroic, or brutal and compassionate. We have the, this range of choice that we can move one way or another. Now, as we look at the anarchist's view of human nature, though, I'd like to try to place it in the context of other perceptions of humanity and human nature among schools of political theory at this time and uh, do what I try to do in the Thoreau lecture, too, to place his ideas in the context of other schools of thought. Remember, we were talking about Thoreau. We spoke of how his ideas compared with liberal thought and conservative thought. Well, if we do the same thing with Emma Goldman and her anarchist principles, let's look at how other schools of thought at this time, the early 20th century, thought about human nature and try to generalize about this. First, there were the conservatives. Conservative thought goes back at least to Machiavelli in terms of the people that we've considered. And uh, certainly it's represented by people like Freud, who have a dark, grim view, a view of human nature. That is, human nature is basically not benign, but malign. People are aggressive. They want to inflict harm on one another. Uh, they're not to be trusted. I think the view is expressed best in a sentence by our great founding father, Alexander Hamilton, who said once, the public, the public is a great beast. And uh, that conservative attitude that because the public is a beast, we need a monarchical system in the United States, contrary, of course, to what Jefferson thought, Hamilton argues consistently that this, is, this is, uh, follows from human nature. We need plenty of control, political control, in this view. Now, the conservatives today have Many of them shifted from this position, but the tradition of conservatism, going back, as I mentioned, in the context of the Thoreau lecture to Hegel uh, as well, the tradition of conservatism calls for a strong power, whether Machiavelli's prince. Freud likes the idea of a strong leader, not a Hitlerian leader, but a leader who will represent the best of civilization, and that's not much defined, as he defines civilization, but it's sure better than the id. And from Freud's point of view, in the context of, say, the Nazi experience, the worst is when a leader yields to the power of the id, as Hitler did in Germany, embodies the id, and abandons or, or surrenders the role of the superego. So from the conservative thinking of Freud, we need a strong leader who will represent civilization at its best. That's the first theory of human nature, then, that uh, human nature is malign and it needs control, the conservative position. Then there is the communist position, uh, taken up especially by Marx, but also by Lenin and Mao. In this position, human nature is infinitely malleable, and uh, the revolutionary leader can shape it through powerful leadership of a party. Uh, the vast majority of people will gladly follow, not because they are so much in the Grand Inquisitor's terms weak and vile, but just they're malleable. Uh, they can be shaped. And, the political theorist Sheldon Woolen, who's written a superb comment on Lenin in his book Politics and Vision. Sheldon Woolen says of Lenin that Lenin saw humanity as a glob. That is, in, well, in Woolen's words, the pliable stuff of revolutionary opportunity. It is to be shaped then by the sculptor to create a beautiful sculpture of humanity. That's the Marxist vision, Leninist vision, and it was the Maoist vision. 
Now, this vision goes often badly off track, of course, as we know in the case of the excesses of the revolutionaries of our time, but nevertheless, it's that idea that human nature has this stuff in it that can be shaped as a, as a glob into a, a beautiful representation of our ultimate ideal. But it has to be shaped by a powerful leader, by an authority that will take charge. Third, there's the fascist theory, including here, I think, the Grand Inquisitor, certainly Hitler and Stalin. And in this case, I think, it's dis I think it is to be distinguished from the communist position. Often we group communists and fascists together, but I think that the communist position is different from the fascist position. And uh, the communist position sees, remember, human nature as infinitely malleable. The fascist position, I think, and I'll be talking about this more next time in the context of Hitler's Mein Kampf, sees human nature as infinitely gullible. Uh, that is just foolish, a very limited intelligence. And as we'll see when we talk about Hitler, Hitler's idea of propaganda is that you have to keep repeating the same slogan over and over again because people are so stupid and uh, they have to be, have to be transformed, uh, but transformed into um, helots or individuals to serve the Nazi state. Above all, there is uh, the emphasis on deception then. And here's where the Grand Inquisitor comes in, deception through using miracle, mystery, and authority. The communists appeal to history, the fascists appeal often to magic and to domination and dehumanization. Now, in these four perceptions of humanity, then, the, the anarchists fit. That is, from the anarchist point of view, a human nature is, as we said, benign, not malign, not infinitely malleable, because they don't want anybody to seize the powerful leadership to shape it. Uh, certainly not infinitely gullible, because they have a high view of humanity. I think Thoreau captures it with all his suspicion of the masses. Nevertheless, he says about the character of the American people uh, that they would do right if only government would not get in their way. Now, that's the early instinct of the anarchist emphasizing choice, conscience, uh, ultimate values, the responsibility then of the of the individual. Uh, now. From the point of view of Goldman, then, uh, uh, human nature is seen in precisely this way, and uh, she asks, what about human nature? Can it be changed? And the words here that she uses are important. With human nature caged by the state in such a narrow space and whipped daily into submission, how can we even imagine its potentialities? But she imagines them. That is, that there can be freedom, expansion, opportunity, above all, peace and repose. And anarchism alone can teach us, she says, the real dominant factors of human nature and its wonderful possibilities. Again and again, she says, anarchism stands then for the liberation of people from the shackles and restraint of government which stifle human nature. Anarchism stands for a social order based on a free grouping of individuals according to the vast potentials that they have because of their nature. She keeps coming back to this idea then that human nature is so filled with potential that if we will only liberate it from the authority of the state, we'll be able then through that emancipation to get a just, a fair, and equal, a free, a harmonious society. Now the second principle of anarchist philosophy is cooperation or community. The anarchists insist, as Rousseau did, uh, that the reason why we have such a corrupt society is uh, that we encourage, in our capitalist system especially, so much competition. And over and again, they're arguing for cooperation instead of competition. The key figure here that inspires so many of the anarchists is Peter Kropotkin. Kropotkin is a Russian anarchist who was a geologist and who wrote a book that had immense influence on anarchists of the 20th century called Mutual Aid. And in that book, Mutual Aid, Kropotkin said that we must be guided, guided in our acts by our perception of oneness with each human being. For in the ethical progress of man, mutual support, not mutual struggle, has had the leading part. And he argues throughout this work, Mutual Aid, that this principle of cooperation is deeply rooted in nature itself. He's a geolog geologist, he's a geographer, he travels around the world, especially through Russia at this time, and observes 
animal life. And he says, as soon as we study animals, not in laboratories and museums only, but in the forest, the prairie, the steppe, the mountains, this is a quotation from Mutual Aid, we had once per perceived that though there is an immense amount of warfare and extermination going on amidst various species, especially amidst various classes of animals, there is at the same time as much or perhaps even more of mutual support, mutual aid, mutual defense amongst, amidst animals belonging to the same species or at least to the same society. Therefore, sociability is as much a law of nature as mutual struggle. This was his reply to Darwin. And he concludes then, don't compete. Competition is injurious to our species. You have plenty of resources to avoid it. That is the tendency of nature, not always realized in full, but always present. Therefore, combine, practice mutual aid. That is the surest means for giving to each and to all the greatest safety, the best guarantee of existence and progress, bodily, intellectual, and moral. That is what nature teaches us. And then finally, he says, man is appealed to be guided in his acts, not merely by love, which is always personal or at the best tribal, but by the perception of his oneness with each human being. In the practice of mutual aid, which we can retrace to the earliest beginnings of evolution, we find the positive and undoubted origin of our ethical conceptions. And he looks to what he calls the loftier evolution of our race, of our species, if only we will learn how to cooperate. That's the argument. And anarchists have been so often accused, it seems to me, of promoting disorder that they write especially on the need for organization, for cooperative organization, not based upon the principle of hierarchical state authority or hierarchy, hierarchy of anything. Uh, they cite various voluntary organizations that are not hierarchical. And Goldman particularly writes about the need for the right kind of organization in promoting the ideal of cooperation. She says, the general contention that anarchists are opposed to organization and hence stand for chaos is absolutely groundless. True, we do not believe in the compulsory, arbitrary side of organization that would compel people of antagonistic tastes and interests into a body and hold them there by coercion. Organization as the result of natural blending of common interests brought about through voluntary adhesion Anarchists do not only not oppose, but believe in as the only possible basis of social life. So the principle here is one of cooperation leading to harmony, but the cooperation must be based upon voluntary organizations, not set up hierarchically. She is obviously opposed to patriarchy and inveighs against patriarchy as inherently hierarchical and argues instead that the women's organizations that she cites are non-hierarchical and can teach men a great deal. And this becomes a theme of, of uh, feminist thought uh, over and again. Uh, for example, uh, Kathy Ionello has written on this in a book, Organizations Without Hierarchy. Uh, feminists uh, will use this as a key point, that Cooperate, cooperation, organization can exist without domination, without hierarchy. And that's the anarchist point of view. But we have to learn these, these uh, ideas. Now, the third principle of anarchist philosophy is their opposition to the state, as I've been saying, as getting in the way of social progress. And uh, we only need to recall what Thoreau said about the state, and that is, is that it is half-witted. It never confronts a man's moral sense, and he declared, remember, war with the state, refused to pay any taxes. Goldman takes all of this up with enthusiasm. She seizes on Thoreau's condemnation of the state, but she was equally influenced by Kropotkin and continually then invokes Kropotkin's mutual aid when she writes about this principle of our true liberation, our liberation outside of the state. When she's speaking about our liberation from the state, I think one of her key points is relating to power. That's the, re that's the recurrent theme. For example, in this passage, she says, our true liberation, individual and collective, lies in our emancipation from authority and from the belief in it. 
Political absolutism has been abolished because men have realized in the course of time that absolute power is evil and destructive. But the same thing is true of all power, whether it be the power of privilege, of money, of the priest, of the politician, or even of the so-called democracy. In its effects on individuality, it matters little what the particular character of coercion is, whether it be as black as fascism, as yellow as Nazism, or as pretentiously red as Bolshevism. It's a power that corrupts and degrades both master and slave, and it makes no difference whether the power is wielded by an autocrat, by parliament, or by Soviets. More pernicious than the power of a dictator is that of a class. The most terrible is the tyranny of a majority. Now notice the way in which then the sweeping condemnation of power applies to all states. She applies it to, obviously, the Bolshevik state and the fascist states, but she continues and indicts democracy itself in Thorovian fashion as being guilty of the tyranny of the majority. That indictment is questioned repeatedly by the communists and Engels, Marx, had much to say about why the anarchists were wrong. Uh, Engels, for example, speaking in a Marxist point of view, uh, condemned the anarchists roundly. He said, the anarchists put the whole thing upside down. They declare that the proletarian revolution must begin by doing away with the political organization of the state, but to destroy the state at such a moment would be to destroy the only organism by which the victorious proletariat can assert its newly conquered power hold down its capitalist adversaries. Now that's Engels speaking from a Marxist point of view against the anarchists. And Engels, I think in an almost ominous way when we see how Marxism then developed in the 20th century, said it's absurd to speak as the anarchists do of the principle of authority as being absolutely evil. The point is that communists must seize authority in order to achieve the revolution. Well, that difference between the anarchists and the communists was to be a difference that uh, prevailed throughout the 20th century. Now, the next principle, the fourth principle that I want to discuss, is that of liberty and equality together. That is the argument the, the anarchists make that liberty cannot exist without equality. That is, as they say repeatedly, no one is free unless all are free free from economic deprivation as well as free from political oppression. We must all have, they argue, the real opportunity to advance ourselves and this opportunity is not genuine in a society where there's a permanent underclass. Uh, there's the saying that uh, you probably know that's made by anarchists and others as well that rich and poor alike have the freedom and equality to sleep in the streets. It's just that the rich don't seem to take advantage of that opportunity very often. The point is that freedom is incomplete without economic opportunity, the opportunity to uh, then make the most of one's life. And as Emma Goldman says, we reach out for the wider scope of human relations, which real liberty alone can give, for true liberty is not a mere scrap of paper, which the liberals call the Constitution, the legal right, or the law. It's not an abstraction derived from the non-reality known as the state. It's not the negative thing of being free from something, because with such freedom you can starve to death. Real freedom, the freedom that we want, true liberty is positive. It's freedom to achieve something. It's the freedom to be, to do, in short, the freedom of actual and active opportunity. The less privileged must be empowered to be free. Well, those are the ringing words, then, that for the anarchists solve the problem that we've cited often, that is, the more liberty, the less equality, the more equality, the less liberty, that seems to characterize, represent the dilemma of democracy. The anarchists say that we must empower individuals, empower them by giving them the economic opportunity that they need in order to be truly free. That will then reconcile freedom with equality. Now the fifth and last principle of anarchism, and Emma Goldman emphasizes this, is the relationship to, of means to ends. 
and that is what goes around comes around, or as Gandhi liked to say, we reap as we sow. Uh, to understand her profound statement on this, uh, some more of her life story is necessary briefly, uh, she got into such trouble in the United States in 1919 and earlier for our preaching resistance to World War I uh, that after she was released from prison in 1919, she was sent to the Soviet Union, exiled forever from the United States, never to return. Having been deported to the Soviet Union, she anticipated that perhaps she would discover in the Bolshevik Revolution at least a beginning of freedom in Russia. Uh, she found the opposite, persecution of all dissenters by Lenin, including the anarchists. She met Lenin and she protested. And she liked especially the story that she had heard when she got there, which is attributed to an anarchist. Uh, the story is that the anarchist, not Emma Goldman, but an earlier anarchist who was in serious trouble with Lenin's state and the persecution of anarchists there, went and met Lenin and said, Comrade Lenin, we're all revolutionaries, but you're going too far. Even anarchists are being imprisoned now, and how can you do that? Whereupon Lenin was supposed to have replied impatiently, um, don't you realize, comrade, that one must break eggs in order to make an omelet? And then the anarchist answered, uh, yes, I see the broken eggshells everywhere, but where is the omelet? And that is the problem from Emma Goldman's point of view. There were lots of broken eggs, uh, but no omelet. We waited for decades for the omelet to emerge, and it never happened. And so she focused in her theory of revolution on the relationship of means to ends. That is, if one is going to engage in violence, lots of broken eggs, then there has to be an end achieved as a result of it. And as she repeatedly criticized, condemned the Bolshevik Revolution with real courage because it was not popular for a leftist at that time to condemn Bolshevism. But she speaks against Bolshevism. She says that the perversion of the ethical values that we see in the Bolshevik Revolution came about as a result of their great slogan, and that is, the end justifies all means. She argues that the Inquisition had the same, same line. And uh, both the Inquisition and the Bolshevik Revolution then offer an important lesson for all coming revolutions for the future of mankind. And that is that there is no greater fallacy than the belief that aims and purposes are one thing while methods and tactics are another. No revolution can ever succeed as a factor of liberation unless the means used to further it be identical in spirit and tendency with the purposes to be achieved. Today is the parent of tomorrow. The present casts its shadow far into the future. The means used to prepare the future becomes its cornerstone. Now, that was a key comment that Gandhi, of course, was to emphasize as well. That is the necessary logical connection between ends and means. Never permitted to return to the United States then, Emma Goldman died alone in Toronto in 1940. She represents anarchism today, though, in its purest form, because she was one who certainly lived its principles as well as eloquently practicing them.